Hi, this is Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love Online on Tuesday, and we are dealing with having a, a determined attitude, kicking the devil in the balls rather than letting him kick us in the teeth, and also fighting our flesh. Anyway, that's some of what we're talking about. And some of this is about a fight, ready to fight. Put up your dukes. All right. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Let me tell you one seducing spirit before I go any further. This is Pat's two cents right here. You know one seducing spirit? You know what the name of a seducing spirit is? I'm going to open your eyes to some stuff. You think it's sex. Well, you know, that's the obvious. There are many seducing spirits. And one of them is named suicide. Another is named depression. Another is named hatred. I mean, it. the list goes on. Any seducing spirit that can seduce you into a mindset that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, the love of God, and the knowledge of Christ, that is a seducing spirit. Now, verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, what this deals with is when you yield to seducing spirits too often, and seducing spirits become one with your flesh. What you end up doing is cooling off the flame of righteousness that burns within. And you end up becoming, over time, lukewarm. And when you get to the point where you don't care anymore, you better beg God to pull you back in before you get too far out. And we'll deal with that as well. Now, I'm going to share with you how dangerous it is to play on the outskirts of sin. Years ago when I was at the beach, I got in the water. And one of our family members was announcing, everybody be very careful. Don't go out too far. There's a rip tide and it's very strong. Now, I had never heard that before, but I knew what it meant. As soon as he said it, I knew what it meant. It just made sense. The water looks like it's coming in, but it's pulling out from underneath. The lower water, the water that's near the sand is pulling it's got a stronger current than the water that's at the surface coming in. So when the waves are coming in, you feel that pull on your ankles when it goes back out. And it's way stronger than the water was when it was coming in on you. That's a riptide. Now, this is what happens. Many of us can get easily caught up in the riptide, in light, in sin, in our flesh caught up with seducing spirits lying to us, convincing us mm -hmm, to give up the ghost on Jesus. Now, and to give up the ghost on yourself. Now, when I was in the water, I was floating. I was floating on the surface. Show you how strong that riptide is. You know, when I stood up, there was no bottom. And the people on the shore look like little ants. I had drifted out so far in such a short period of time. That was a brief moment. Couldn't have been no more than five or ten minutes. I was out that far. I could not believe it. So you have to be careful when you play on the banks. When you play on the outskirts. You have to be careful. God is merciful, yeah. But you got to be careful. Now, for those, on you, for those of you on YouTube, I don't know how hard you're trying to live for God. I don't know if you think the effort is worth it or not. 
But I tell you what, <clears throat> let's put it like this. I would rather be in a vacuum living for God than be at a giant celebration living for Satan where everything I could do, every bit of mischief I could get my hands on is right there at that celebration. And it's got thousands of people all around me. I would rather be in a vacuum. And the reason I say that is because the vacuum bears a certain level of protection. Unfortunately, in the vacuum, it's lonely. In the vacuum, it's quiet. In the vacuum, it's uneventful and can be very boring. But you're safe, and even though you're in that vacuum, God can minister the love, the peace, the joy, the exuberance, the excitement for being alive, your assignment. Do you know that the book of Revelations was written in a vacuum, so to speak? Think about that. The Isle of Patmos, where John was sent as a prisoner, where he had no interpersonal relations with other people and all that time instead of him weeping tears of loneliness crying his eyes out having all all kind of issues with God how could you abandon me and leave me on this island all alone no he prayed and he prayed and he prayed like that pit bull's determination and he got a hold of God. And God got a hold of him. And next thing you know, what happened? He was on assignment. He had to watch all of these visions. All of these visions. He wasn't on the island complaining. He wasn't on the island wallowing in pity. He was on the island pressing in to God. And when you press into God, he presses into you. And the twain shall forever meet. And they were connected. Serious lockdown connection. That no nobody and nothing could break. And during that strong connection. That was his strongest connection with God. All these visions came to him. And God wanted him to write it down. And that is our book of Revelation. What might God want to do in your life? What mighty thing might God want to do in you? Through the vacuum. Huh? On, an, on a deserted island. What might God want to do with you? Isolated. Set apart. Alone. Bored. When God gets a hold of you, baby, and you get on his assignment, you get busy about his business, you ain't got time to be bored. You don't have time to just sit there with tears running down your face. Because the connection with God, oh my goodness. See, that's why I want all of you to concentrate before the last days get rolling real good. Concentrate right now while you got this moment of peace. Concentrate on pressing in until you see the face of God, till you feel the love of God, till you feel the touch of God and the witness in your spirit that you are the child of God. When you get that, I'm telling you, nothing can shake you off your little foundation, baby. Nothing. Nobody. Because you know that you know. You want a no-so experience. Not a guess-so, a no-so. Not a hope-so, a no-so. What a no-so can no turkey, can no devil in hell knock you off your foundation. That's what the Bible means when it says, and you shall not be moved. Satan can't shake you in the, in the wind like trees, leaves shaking all in the wind. He can't intimidate you and discourage you and 
move you and turn your attention. No, because you're determined through hook or crook, you will not lose out on God. You may lose out on that man. You may lose out on that lay in the hay with that sister. You may lose out on that money. You may lose out on that opportunity that you know is, is shady. You may lose out on, on having a whole lot of popularity and a whole lot of fun. You may lose out on a lot of stuff, but baby cakes, it ain't nothing. Once you experience God, that is like looking at vomit. I'm telling you, and see, this is the reason I say that, because I, you're looking at one who is bent on mischief, me, yes, yes, all kind of mischief, y'all, all kind of mischief, but what has me steady, even when I get frustrated with God, and yes, I do, and yes, I have many times, and told him so too. No matter how I feel, the one thing I know is what side my bread is buttered on. Mm -hmm. See, I've been out there in those streets long enough to know that the friendships you think you have are either about sex or either about convenience, either about money, either about what you can do for them or just that they ain't got nothing better to do. The love factor, no. It ain't there, baby. All that love that your inner core has longed for all your life, you will never find it out in those streets. You'll never find it in that bed. You'll never find it at the end of that pipe. You never find it at the bottom of the, bo of the bottle. Nowhere in that bottle. You will never find it at the end of a joint. You won't find it on the adult pacifier, the cigarette. You won't find it on any of that stuff. You won't find it in your clothes. You won't find it in, your, in the gambling shack. I've been at all them places, baby. You won't find it selling your butt on the street. There's nothing, there's nothing out there that can satisfy the longing of the soul. And I'm not fussing, I'm emphatic because I know what I'm talking about. Now, I don't know it all. There's a whole lot about the Bible, about God, about the walk with life and all kind of issues we deal with. I don't know. I ain't God, I ain't trying to be. But I tell you what, I know God loves me. You can't take that one away from me. You can take my money. You can take my house. You can take my car. You can take my name. You can take my fame. You can take whatever. But you cannot take the fact that God loves me away from me. That is the cornerstone of my soul is that God loves me. And I pray that you press in and pursue God like you pursue a piece of tail out there when you're hot and horny. Like you pursue the internet when you want to do your thing. Pursue God like that. And tell him, I need you to show me you love me. I need that inner witness. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Baptize me in your Holy Spirit. Make us one. I want to know you, Lord. I want to see you. I want to feel you. I want to experience you. There is nothing else. No other temptation. We slip and slide. We, we trip over our feet. But we know not to go too far because we cannot afford to lose out on what God has for us. I tell everybody I know, if heaven, it's a song, if heaven 
never was promised to me. Neither God's promise for me to live eternally. It's been worth just having the Lord in my life. Living in a world of darkness, he brought me the light. If there were never any streets of gold, neither a land where we would never grow old, it's still been worth just having the Lord in my life. Living in a world of darkness, he brought me the light. My darkness was dark because I lived, this is me talking now, because I lived a life of turmoil, inner turmoil constantly, constant doubts, constant fears, constant questions, constant sadness, constant aggravation, constant hopelessness, constant, constant, constant. I was so sick of myself, I didn't know what to do. But it wasn't until God came in my life that I actually came alive. I actually felt alive for the first time in my life. It wasn't the day I got saved. It was a little while down the road. And when I experienced his love, it wasn't the day I got saved. It was quite a ways down the road. But it was through hot pursuit. I pursued God. And I continued to pursue God because I knew if I didn't get the connection, if I get, didn't get that inner witness, think of that word, inner witness. If I didn't get that inner witness, I would never be sure. And it would be easy for me to be knocked off my foundation. When you're not glued to it, baby, it's easy to be knocked off. Any little shaking can knock you off. You've got to find that glue that nothing can break the bond of. And that's that inner witness that you are God's and God is yours and God loves you. Mm. And then as you go down the road and you get pick up promises straight from God that he told you to read in the Bible. You didn't know what it said till you went to it. And you went to Psalms 91 or Psalms 37 or Psalms 105 or Psalm 46. And you're looking at these scriptures and you don't know what they say, but you ask God a question and there's the direct answer to your specific question. Because you've been on hot pursuit. And he promises you stuff. And you know you heard from God. Or you open the Bible and you don't feel like reading, but you start reading anyway. And you feel God smiling on you. And he's only smiling on you because you chose to read his word. Something that mundane. And he's smiling. You actually feel it. You know where the smile is coming from. Okay. I don't want to get caught up in that. I'm going to get on with what I'm saying here. But that's what I'm talking about. You need that inner witness. Write it down. Inner witness. Pursue God for the inner witness. Pursue God for his love. Pursue God for the baptism of his Holy Spirit. Now, it can take different forms, so I ain't going to put no box in it. You let God do you the way he wants to do you. Let the sky be, the, there is no limit. Forget the limit. Ain't no sky, ain't no limit, nowhere. All right, let me go on to 2 Timothy, because I got to read Romans. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, this is for all of you guys who have a calling on your life. You have to see the big picture. The big picture is not, is not that you got saved and you're forgiven. That's not the big picture. That's the switch that turns the power on. That's just getting started. Huh. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at the appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word be instant in season and 
out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That's a warning. Now we're going to go to that speaks for itself. We're going to go to Romans chapter 8. This is the longer read. All right. Starting at verse 1, going down to verse 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, after, after the flesh, but after the spirit. Come on, Lord. Come on. All right. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, in his flesh, the flesh of Jesus. Yeah, he condemned sin on that cross. All right. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they, listen, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded, to be carnally minded, and I repeat once more, to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh, so that they that are in the flesh cannot please. God, they can't. It's not in them. Wow. Okay. So, that's what I want you to think about. You've got to get your determination from somewhere. Fire has to be fueled. These are the ways you fuel your fire. You pray those boring prayers when you don't feel like talking to an empty room, wondering if God's even listening to you. You read God's word when you don't even like to read. Read it to yourself out loud so you don't fall asleep. That's a good trick. And standing up if you will fall asleep while you're talking. All right. Sit down. And write a list of the things, if you have to write, if you can use your memory, that works. But bring to your remembrance all the things God has done and begin to thank him for it and begin to praise him. He, the Bible says, he inhabits the praises of his people. Are you ever taking the time to praise him? Sometimes when I feel the devil come on me with melancholy, when I feel the devil come on me when nobody cares about me, I will at times do a reverse, a counterattack. And my counterattack on the devil which does confuse the enemy. Praise confounds the enemy. That's Bible too. Even though I ain't feeling it, y'all, even though I'd rather cry than do this, I do this anyway. Lord, I praise you. Father, I glorify your name. Thank you, Lord, that you love me so much. 
Thank you, Lord, that you're mindful of me. Thank you, Father, that you've given me that peace that I could never get until I got you. Thank you, Lord, for giving me a self-esteem. Thank you for all the inner healing you've done in me. Thank you, Lord, for all the times that you blessed me with me and my husband. Thank you for this beautiful house. Thank you for the times you intervened when I thought I was going to go under when people came against me and you were my defense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The list goes on ad infinitum. Once you start naming one thing, another thing pops in. And it's like popcorn. They all start popping up in your head. And you find you got a whole lot of reasons to thank and praise God for taking such good care of you. See, our biggest enemy is self, flesh, pride, and the devil and everything that comes with his package. Those are our enemies. God is not. He's not your enemy. He's your friend. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's your friend. He's the friend you want to keep. But you have to climb and maintain you have to rise above the flesh and get out of that meat, that meat grind and get into the spirit realm where you think on the things of God. You pray on the things of God. You seek the things of God. You long for the things of God. Hot pursuit. I saw a movie last night and oh my goodness, it tore my heart. This guy was so in love with this lady and she suddenly got sick and they found out she was dying. <clears throat> and she slipped just that quick into a coma. The parents came, listen to this determination. Seems like everything I watched and heard in the last two days is culminating into this message. Um, this woman was in the hospital in a coma, being, I mean, she was on life support, basically. The doctor had written her off as technically dead, clinically dead, but they were keeping her alive until the parents gave permission to, to hit the switch. The boyfriend was there. That was not her husband. That was her boyfriend. He was there. Now, these are the parents of the daughter. They needed a day. And they came back and gave the doctor permission with, with tearful eyes. The boy got between the doctor and the machine. Listen to this. Picture it in your mind. He's pulling on the doctor's legs, begging him, begging him, pleading, please, don't, don't, you can't, you gotta let her live. She grabbed my hand, I know she's there, she's there, don't have a heart. I mean, he would not let that doctor get to the machine. His friend walks in with something that had authority over the doctor's decision and it ordered him to wait two days. And that boy, he was so determined. He never went home to take a shower. I'm talking determination. I know this is God because I can't hold it. This determination, this boy, was there next to this woman for two full days round the clock. He would not leave her side except to use the restroom. He or make a call. He was there talking to her, talking to her, singing to her, clowning with her, joking with her, reading to her, talking to her, holding her hand, just everything, just constantly stimulus, constant stimulus. He's putting out, putting out, putting out, putting out, not worrying about sleep, dozing off here and there, and immediately starting up with the talking and the stroking. Just constantly, he was pursuing her life. When everybody else wrote her off, he pursued her life. And right when the doctor came to hit the switch, she coughed. And he said, no, no, she's alive. But he had to hit the switch because the 
then they had to pull the tube out for her to breathe. And she lived. She lived. And everything about her disease said she had to die. That determination, if that can happen like that, imagine what we could get if we pursued God like that. When was the last time you pursued God round the clock? God, please, come on, Lord. When was the last time you did something like that? You might be like John, experiencing visions and all kind of stuff. But we give God five minutes, ten minutes, and we're gone. We're off to the races. Hot pursuit. Hot pursuit. You may not spend your whole life doing it, but do it now to get your foundation set. That's the kind of determination. Round the clock pursuit. Lord, Lord, when are you going to show me your love? Lord, I need you, Lord. I want you, Lord. I... Cry it out to him with all your heart, soul, might, everything. Some of you will beg for a person not to break up with you, but you won't beg God to reveal himself to you. Ooh, where is the hunger for God? See, we don't realize that God responds to hunger. See, when you are hungry for God, when you, okay, let me share this with you. This, this will help. Let's go to the natural. Some of you relate to natural stuff better than spiritual stuff. So let's go to natural. When I put up my easel and I put up my canvas and I start painting, I'm not spiritual about that. I'm just painting. That's a natural activity. Okay. And I'm painting a picture. I'm doing a portrait of somebody. I got their picture here and I got, you know, their photo here and I got the, the, the canvas here. And I'm looking and I'm booking and I'm looking and I'm booking and I'm looking and I'm booking. And it's starting to come alive. It's starting to shape up. It's starting to, yeah, that's them. That's their spirit. That's their personality. Now, do you know I can be on the canvas for 17, 18 hours? And I'm wondering why am I starting to feel so wasted or I'm starting to doze and the, and the brush is starting to drop. And I'm like, oh, my God, what time is it? I've been doing this for 18 hours. I didn't get hungry. What? Yeah. See, when you do something you're passionate about, time flies. You're not thinking about what you don't have. You're not thinking about what you can't do. You're not thinking about what could go wrong. You're not thinking about what's wrong with me. You're not thinking about who doesn't like you. You're not thinking about any of that. Because, see, that's the flesh. Because you're so caught up in this, this project, in this thing. You're so caught up in this thing that you don't realize that while you're caught up in the spirit, you're caught up in the things of God, that you end up losing track of all the nonsense in your life that doesn't add up to a hill of beans. That's being spiritually minded. Being carnally minded is being caught up in all the nonsense, all the petty crap, all the nee 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 and he said, she said, it, and this, that, and the other, and I got this right, and that, 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 why did he do me like that? All that, the, the, the little baby stuff. That's the flesh. That's what Satan will have you caught up in. What God wants you caught up in is him. All the creation he has placed in you to carry out for him. But you're caught up in what you want to do for you. What bothers you? What inconveniences you? What hurts you? What disappoints you? No, when you get caught up in the things of God, you don't have time. Your life is way more worth living because you're about purpose. When you're about God's purpose, he fills you. When you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. What are you hungry 
hungry for? What are you on hot pursuit for? That's what you got to think about. And I'm going to leave you with that. You don't have to worry about being carnally minded when you're godly minded. You don't have to be worried about being caught up in the, in the dictates of your flesh when everything you're doing is so caught up with God, time flies. I remember one time I was at the easel painting and I didn't realize it. Milton came out about two, three in the morning. He's like, baby, what you doing? Why aren't you in bed? I was like, well, what time is it? He said, it's three in the morning. I was like, oh my God. It felt like I'd only been sitting there two or three hours. And I had been on that painting for about eight. Didn't realize how much time flew. Get in God's face and see how fast time flies. See how quick and how exuberant things are when you connect with him, when you experience his love, you experience his peace. See how that happens. See what it does to you. You can't have nothing shake you off your foundation. Yes, you'll trip in the sin from here and there. But you won't stay there, baby, because the stench of it will have you recoil. You'll be back on track in a New York minute. You ain't got time for that crap. You got too many things going for you and God. Okay, I'm going to leave you with that, and we're done. I'm going to open up the mics, and you guys can comment. Let me stop the recording. But that's what you have to think about. You need an inner witness that you are a child of God, and that God loves you, and your life will be so much more fulfilling. God bless you.